Engineer Maurice Akech is the Executive Director and Registrar of Contractors at the National Construction Authority. This is the body that basically, uh, he'll tell us, but it is in charge of Regulate <laughs> a lot of regulating and everything in construction, construction in okay. the country. Yeah. Welcome to Kenya's Biggest Conversation. Good to have you again. Thank you, Atif and uh, Tim. And I really appreciate this opportunity once again to engage uh, uh, citizens of our beautiful country on matters construction, mm. on matters regulations, and how we can keep ourselves safe as we continue doing our work around the country. Very good. Thank you. To welcome you, CT has the day's proverb. Mm -hmm. This week's proverbs are from which country? The Republic of Guinea. Mm -hmm. Not Equatorial Guinea, not Guinea-Bissau, not Papua New Guinea, and not guinea fowl. <laughs> the Republic of <laughs> Guinea. <laughs> the proverb does not come from Guinea fowl. No, it doesn't. <laughs> Just, you know, you never know. Someone's mind may wander in that direction. Mm. They may be thinking some avian creature. Mm. So we are disabusing them of that notion completely. <laughs> okay. Uh, <yeah. laughs> he who builds his own throne rules over a desert. He who builds his own throne rules over a desert. Mm. Engineer, what's your translation of this one? That's very profound. Mm. It means you have the powers, you have the discretion that uh, once you build your own property, you own it, you rule over it, and nobody else can come to take over from you. So it's yours. That's my interpretation. Mm. So basically, it's the ownership aspect. Ukijenga okay. niyako. Yes. Come with me. <laughs> yeah. you know, I am actually fascinated. <laughs> and this is the beauty of having people from with many the diverse backgrounds of disciplines. The interpretation often will be influenced somewhat by the discipline. The background. Yes. <laughs> yes. They contextualize. Yeah, they really contextualize it and it brings out interpretation that you couldn't have thought of yourself. Mm. Yes. Because I wouldn't have thought of it in those terms that uh, Engineer Kitch has just mentioned. Mm. No, not really. It's an interesting one. Yes, Maybe it is. the creators of this particular quote mm. may have had an idea. Mm. What was the intention behind this quotation quote? The, the, uh, Papa had a little background, is in order. This country, after colonization and at independence, by the way, it got independence 65 years ago. Mm. Okay. Yes. But the thing that has characterized this country is they have had coup after coup after coup after coup after coup. Okay. Yes. Yes. 2021, 20, uh, the gentleman called Alpha Conde, who was the president, again, he was removed. M meaning, it's like people have known more coups than they've known stability and peace <laughs> <laughs> in this country. Mm. <laughs> so you, you have to wonder. <laughs> <laughs> Mm -hmm. And by the way, it's all in the name of the people. Eh? Yeah. Yes, so that you understand. Sure. For the people. Sure. The people. Mm. Mm. Sure. <laughs> Engineer Ketch, so you're a regulator of the construction, construction industry. industry in Kenya. Yes. Um, we had a conversation a couple of weeks back with the first executive director and registrar, uh, who is now a member of parliament, architect Dr. Manduku. Yes. And he was talking about the building code and you're saying, you know what, one of the things that we've had a problem with in this country is we are talking about building houses in 2023 and we are still using a code that was for building houses in 1968. We need to change. Yes. Are we on the path to changing? Thank you uh, so much for this opportunity. And that's the reason I'm here today. Mm. Uh, just to follow up on the conversation you had and it's good you've given a background and history of uh, where we are coming from and where we need to be. Currently, we're using a document, a building code, that was uh, 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 promulgated way back in 1968. Now, 1968 now is more than 50 years. 50 years down the line, a number of things have really changed in the areas of materials mm. for construction, in the areas of technology for construction, in the areas of design for construction, in the areas of te construction itself as a method and also as far as, as maintenance is concerned. So the conversation we are having here now is um, the new proposed building code that is meant to repeal the building code that was uh, uh, put up in 1968. Mm. And the new building code is uh, 
at now its tail end. We've been working on it for a number of years now. And uh, National Construction Authority, um, through the National Construction Authority Act, was uh, amended in 2020, March, mm. to introduce the development and, uh, and uh, enforcement of the building code. Mm. Meaning that the 1968 building code uh, used to be under the Local Authorities Act, mm. which, as you know, it uh, was repealed in uh, 2012 mm. with the coming of, 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 of um, um, the County um, County County Act, mm -hmm. this, the, the County Government Act, yes. 2012, that repealed the Local Authorities Act, where the building code was domiciled. Remember, a building code is a regulation, and as a regulation, it needs to have a, an, anchor a, a mother, act. an anchor act. Mm. So that anchor act was uh, repealed, so it lost a home. So fast forward in 2020, under the National Constitution Authority Act, the government made a strategic decision to have the NC Act amended to introduce the development and uh, enforcement of the building code. Mm. So we started working on it around that time, though previously, of course, a lot of work had been done, mm. but uh, there was no home. So now, um, a home was found, uh, which is the uh, NCA Act, mm. and uh, we've been working on this document for uh, about two to three years now. Mm. Uh, where we have reached now is the point where we've engaged um, um, widely across the country, all the stakeholders in their built environment, within and outside. Outside includes even users, inside means implementers and policy makers. Mm. We've also done uh, validation and uh, the the code is basically ready. The document is basically ready. Mm -hmm. About 344 pages with um, 517 articles mm. touching from when you begin, you think about construction to when you finish and when you maintain it. Everything is inside there. And um, this code currently is uh, 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 waiting to be presented to uh, Parliament. And we know we have two houses, the National Assembly and the Senate, so that it can now be uh, considered or approved mm -hmm. for it to take a legal effect. Mm -hmm. That's the stage where we are currently on. And uh, very soon, uh, we will need to see that happening. Now, why the new building code? Very important. The 1968 code um, is uh, very prescriptive in the sense that it defines what you should use without giving you option. <laughs> like for instance, if mm. you're constructing a wall, a normal wall for a building, mm. it tells you you should use a stone, mm -hmm. maybe Nairobi blue stone, mm -hmm. even if you're building in uh, Mombasa. It says Arisa. Nairobi blue stone. Yeah, because that was the stone that started construction those days. <laughs> then it also tells you it must be this thick, mm. uh, 200 millimeters, but those days, of course, you're measuring in feet. Nine so by inches, twelve. Yes, inches. Mm. So that is how prescriptive it is. The new code is uh, very flexible and performance-based. It tells you that as long as what you're using for building the wall meets this performance requirements, then you're good to go, which means it gives opportunity for innovators, <coughs> for those who are... Uh, in the space of uh, materials development mm. to come up with any <coughs> material as long as it meets those requirements. For instance, it tells you that uh, the wall must be made of a material that can give a fire rating of this much before it burns out completely because fire may be an hazard uh, as, as uh, um, aspect in a construction. Yeah. It tells what, how long it should burn before breaks down. Mm. So as long as it meets those performance requirements, it also tells you it must meet these strength requirements, yeah. how strong it should be, and so on and so forth. Among many other things, the old code did not consider universal access. Universal access here means that uh, the building should be accessible to anyone, yeah. anybody, regardless of their physical status or condition. Okay. Meaning it takes care of the mm, people ramps. living with disabilities, mm. so introduction of ramps, lifts, and so on and so forth. Mm. The other thing it talks about is the we the space of climate change. So we can also consider the issue of green construction, sustainable construction, construction that is environmentally sustainable, socially sustainable, economically sustainable, so that it meets the needs of today and tomorrow. It is not in order for us to do construction today that our uh, children coming tomorrow 
or grandchildren or great grandchildren will be asking what our forefathers thinking when they were, they were doing this construction. <laughs> we should not interfere with the environment. It mm -hmm. should be used in a way that it's sustainable. Mm -hmm. Also, the code uh, enhances the issues of health and safety within and around the construction. This is very important. So this code actually is a total a total um, uh, a me a metaphor or a total uh, shift, shift from what we had to what we are looking to have, and also embrace emerging technologies, mm -hmm. emerging materials, and a new way of doing things. Sounds like the code yeah. has already been overtaken by practice. Like what we are seeing now being constructed and being hailed as you know these very good and beautiful buildings are not adhering to the 1968 code. Am I right? Well, if let's you take walls for instance. Yes. Mm. The walls that people build. Yes. If we were adhering to the 1968 code, would we have broken glass and barbed wire at the top of uh, the walls that we have? Well, you know, there is what we call internationally accepted uh, <coughs> standards mm. and ways of construction. You know, we are living in a global space. Uh, the code we have in 19, of 1968 is our own code. Mm. But as you know it, it was uh, basically a document that was, uh, uh, can I use that borrowed? Mm. Yes. And then... Um, Imposed. Customized. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> to meet our requirements. Mm. You asked a very valid question. That if you are to read today's buildings, will they pass the test of that code? Mm. The answer is it will partially pass. But many things that are not in that code, we'll have to ask yourself, where do we, where do we um, what's the word? How do we make them uh, become uh, compliant mm. with what we are doing? So, yes. Okay. Yes. So if, it's par if people are partially compliant, um, unfortunately, when something happens, it is total destruction, right? So maybe I can ask the question, who is meant to abide by the code? The one for 1968, the 344 page one that you've now done, which I'm assuming takes in parts of the 1968 code, then with current trends and puts that all together, right? Who within the industry is supposed to follow this code? Very good question. Who should uh, uh, work on the code or implement the code or who the code uh, subscribes to? Right. Um, uh, An answer that in two ways. The first one, let's appreciate what the code talks about. Mm. The code talks about design. The code talks about construction. The code talks about operation and maintenance. Uh, what that means is that every player in that space mm. um, uh, will be uh, part of what the code needs to uh, subscribe to. So number one, for the design, the code prescribes um, uh, what, how, and when. Mm. Yeah. So for the design purposes, it means the designers, if the architect is designing a building, mm -hmm. for instance, uh, my predecessor was here uh, before discussing mm -hmm. the same issue, mm -hmm. who is now Moshimewa, is uh, an architect. So if somebody in his space is carrying out a design, which is the first form of uh, um, um, contact with the client, the client is the developer, he'll approach an architect, give a design brief, so, based on the design brief, which is from the user's perspective, the developer's perspective, the architect will be using the code uh, to design the spaces that has been prescribed in the code. For instance, the code will say, if you have a, a site mm. or um, a parcel of land measuring this much, and you want to site a building, siting now means how to place the building within the plots. Uh, this is how it should be done. This is the setback from the boundaries, from the roadside, and so on and so forth. That is the architect now using the code to uh, organize his design to meet the client's requirements okay. and meet the code. So the architect is already there. Mm -hmm. Now, for the engineer, the structural engineer, or the civil engineer for this matter, is carrying a civil engineer whose uh, uh, role is to design a, a building, and that's a structural engineer. Mm -hmm. His work now would be to look at the code and look at what does the code say about foundations, mm -hmm. What does the code say about design of uh, columns and so on and so forth? And the code makes references to other uh, design, um, or what, what they call codes of practice. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, uh, this is a regulation which defines what needs to be done, where and how. Yes. But it also refers to other uh, 
existing codes of practice. Like, for instance, we have, in this country now, we're using the Euro codes. Mm. Previously, they were British standards. Like, for instance, we are designing for a foundation. There's a, a, a code that talks about it, that is referred to that. In that matter, you're designing a wall, a wall, you're designing a roof, you're designing a slab or a floor, and so on and so forth. So the engineer is already working on it. Mm -hmm. If you go to the space of other engineers, like the mechanical uh, that designs the lifts and uh, and air conditioning or not plumbing, or you talk about electrical who designs the issues of uh, lighting and so on and so forth, the code pr has all these prescriptions. Okay. So that's the space of the design. Mm -hmm. If you go to, go to construction, construction is where now we have uh, the contractor who is supposed to procure materials on behalf of the client, put the fundies together, and then um, um, do carry out the construction works. So this code also prescribed the methodologies, the materials, and how they can be used. Mm -hmm. So now in construction space, the contractor is using it. So I've said the architect, the engineer, the contractor. Yeah. Now, remember, before the contractor goes to the ground, the engineer and architect's the design, they have to go to the county for approval right. under the Physical and Land Use Planning Act. And it's very important to note that when the county is carrying out approvals, they'll also be using the code to, do, um, to guide mm -hmm. on those approvals. Mm -hmm. You've met the requirements that the code has prescribed. Okay. So when it comes now to uh, uh, environmental issues, NEMA would also be referring to some parts of the code or even the environmental impact assessors, the experts, mm -hmm. will also be using the same as they prepare the, those uh, uh, reports for NEMA to approve. Mm -hmm. Then uh, when you come to the regulators, National Concern Authority, we'll also be using the same code, code. Mm. To see whether you have met the requirements. So when you are now checking out compliance during a quality, assur uh, quality assurance inspections across the country, the same code will be very necessary for us and very important. Mm. It's like the Bible, a checklist yes. that you have to do this. Have you done it? So right. that's the space that the code is going to occupy and to bring a lot of sanity and semblance in the the way the, the, the construction industry is, uh, is regulated. It is right. Yeah. And this is just for buildings. Is it just for buildings or are we looking at construction of other infrastructure as well? Just for buildings, this code? Well, um, I want to look at it this way. The code primarily mm. uh, prescribes uh, the space of buildings. Okay. But buildings do not stand alone. Indeed. Remember, for you to access a building, you need a road. Yes. Yeah. For a building to function, mm -hmm. you need... Uh, water connections. Yes. Mm. You need uh, uh, waste water mm. yeah. uh, and sanitation. Yeah. You need um, uh, power, uh, power, electricity. Yes. You need telecommunication, yes. and all these things that are associated with the, the building. Yes. So the code is not in isolation. Right. As much as it talks about buildings, but it also looks at the other associated infrastructure. Mm. One important thing also that the code has is the aspect of uh, hazard maps. Mm -hmm. That's called resilient designs. A design that will stand the floods. So if you're doing a design for a building, you have to know uh, the flood um, um, uh, risks. Yeah. yeah whether uh, this place we are doing construction, there'll be floods in future and how you do uh, mitigate about well, the- it's built on a water e e path. E exactly. Okay. Or there's no water path now, but you have to consider what about the future. Right. It talks about earthquakes or the, uh, what we call a seismic um, uh, uh, risk, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, when there's earthquake. Um, and remember, earthquake is not just for buildings, it affects roads, bridges, and so on and so forth, mm. and even dams. Okay. Uh, it talks about uh, wind. You know, when you have very tall buildings, because mm. wind is uh, uh, very important when you're designing very high li rise uh, structures. Mm. It can be a uh, serious risk if it's not considered. Mm. Then lastly, about landslides. You know, you know, mm. and uh, this affects even the road sector. It affects dams. It affects every other thing you think about. Right. So that's why the code is very important because at some point it also has reference or uh, uh, to those uh, hazard maps okay. that we need to consider. That's wind, seismic, which is earthquake, mm. landslides, and floods. So yeah. essentially, this code takes into consideration everything possible, essentially that could happen in this dance with nature also human beings and their interaction everything so it's all inclusive it's all inclusive correct now one would then assume because of this code that's in place which you should follow it's your manual for example we as journalists also have a manual we have a code that we follow correct right so if something goes wrong usually they'll refer you to your code and say excuse me eric um this is what you should have followed. This is how you should have operated. Mm. Now, take, for example, if a building collapses. Based on what you have said is in the code, everything that could have happened 
that this building then has collapsed, has been taken into consideration by the time this individual has been given approval to construct, right? Yes. So, if something goes wrong, you should be able to pinpoint where this thing went wrong and that somebody did not do what they were supposed to do. Is that correct? That's correct, actually. Very right. There is uh -huh. this which prescribes the standards yes. of how you need to do it, mm. where and when. And then there is you as an individual mm. practitioner. Yes. You also have your code of conduct. Right. So there's the building code, which is the regulations, mm -hmm. and the code of conduct of the practitioner. Yes. For instance, even at National Construction Authority, we have a code of conduct for construction industry. Yes. This is different from the building, building code. code. Yes. So the one you are actually alluding to mm. um, uh, speaks to the code of conduct. Yes. Which means the code of conduct that uh, we have at National Construction Authority prescribes the expectation of what a contractor needs to do, mm. a construction worker. These are the people we regulate directly, yes. and um, um, as well as uh, the developer, mm. so that the extent that if you fail to pay mm. your fundi as a contractor, mm. what are some of the uh, actions or ramifications that needs to be done? Mm. If um, a fundi fails to do his part, what needs to be done? If um, a material supplier has not done his part, and so on and so forth, mm. to the extent that this code prescribes, this, this national building code is... Um, you are supposed to provide a material that meets these specifications. Mm. You are supposed to do a window or a door that meets these requirements. You are supposed to do a foundation that is A, B, C, D, and so on and so forth. Right. So there's, uh, the two actually work hand in hand. In hand. Yeah, so there's a code of conduct and there's now the code that prescribes the standards yes. of uh, how to do things in construction. You know, engineer, in our laws, mm. the code will come in as regulations under the NCA Act right yes regulations have a lifespan don't they 10 years and yes. then you review so we are saying that if these regulations go through parliament and they are approved they'll be in effect for 10 years and then we should review them is that sufficient time to be reviewing a building code in fact very good point you've raised one of the challenges you have we have in the 1968 code is because it does not have uh, a life span of its own prescribed within itself mm. so it can continue to be used for quite some time in perpetuity yes <laughs> uh, the new code has got uh, some safeguards in it mm. number one uh, apart from uh, the statutory in instruments act which guides that every regulation must be reviewed after every 10 years the code itself has uh, a provision of a five-year uh, review period that every five years uh, the code will have to be reviewed to check um, um, uh, maybe some of the changes that may have occurred in the construction space in terms of materials in terms of technology so it's a very self uh, 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 re reviewing mechanism mm. that has been embedded in the code so within the five year period they will need to have a review but of course within the 10 years also it's a requirement to review it as a regulation mm. so those safeguards are now there and will give us opportunity and room to ensure that we periodically view th review this code to um, address uh, the changes uh, in the technology, changes in materials, and changes in construction. Because construction is a very um, dynamic uh, industry, yeah. and things keep changing. And we want to give flexibility to innovators, to people who invent uh, new things, so that we, we continue moving. In fact, in the space of affordable housing, um, it benefits a lot uh, uh, by the fact that we have to do things in a different way, not using the conventional traditional methods, mm. so that we have new materials that can be done faster uh, in terms of uh, speed. Mm. Uh, we have materials that can meet the cost requirements and as well as uh, quality. So to look at quality, cost, and, um, and, 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 and time, then there is need to have uh, periodic uh, changes in that space to continue uh, uh, updating uh, this particular code. So that's already provided for in, the, in the new code. Is five years not too soon? I mean, we've just started, barely have you come up with a new building code. Then in five years' time, you need to have reviewed it. That means you've started conversations about it two years into its operationalization. The impact that that has on the industry would be huge because you are planning maybe a new development in a certain area and by the time you're actually breaking ground and completing it, the building code has changed. Well, what is important to note is that even when the code changes, you know, the change is basically to update it to better standards for efficiency and effectiveness. What does that mean? 
Uh, even then, you asked a question at the beginning about uh, whether what we are doing now uh, complies with the old code or with the code that currently uh, we are trying to repeal. Mm. The answer is that what the new code is doing is an update of what you've been doing. It's like adding on top. It's like you had a... It's like what mobiles do. A human being of 100 years ago. System update. And a human being of today is still the same human being, okay. but maybe certain things have may have changed in terms of technology space, if mm. I may use uh, that, that particular uh, example. So what this code, the, every update we'll be doing for the, every five years is look at what are the new things that have come into the space and we need to update into the old code. So basically it's an update. It's not a total overhaul. Okay. Update from time to time to keep it in tandem with the new changes that will be happening. To fix the bugs. If at the time of uh, the review there's no change, then you say Dito. Mm. Yeah. But of course, it will be very hard not to find a change because, uh, as I told you, things are very dynamic. Yeah. Very, yeah. very dynamic. In Guinea, where the problem arises, yes. I have three questions I want to ask you, but I'm just, I just want to comment on this one. Yeah. Every five years, we have an election. And the unfortunate thing about this country is every time you have new leadership, they will come up with some new fangled ideas about everything. <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> and the building code will not escape their notice. Mm. That's just a by the way. Now, question number one, how does the association that you had, how does it interface and how does it work with the association of planners that we have in this country or the planning institutions, the planning bodies, whether they're urban planners or they're physical planners? How do you associate with them? How does your work um, dance in tandem with with, with what they do. Mm. That's question one. Yes, I, I'd like it answered before I go to question two. Mm. Thank you. Mm. Uh, well, National Constitution Authority is uh, <coughs> mandated to oversee and coordinate the development in this can uh, of construction industry in this country, mm. Kenya. Um, as a regulator, we do not operate in a vacuum. We do not operate in isolation. Mm. In fact, we work uh, uh, very collaboratively with all the other players. And for your information, mm. apart from the planners you have mentioned, we planners actually the starting point when you don't do a building because they must plan and uh, uh, prepare the architectural architect must have come after the planning has been done to prepare the, the architectural plans for purposes of development control permission to be obtained from the county for where development is supposed to take place. We also have other 12 other players, very key in this sector. So even the architect that is doing the design is being regulated by the Board of Registration of Architect and Quantity Surveyors, Borax. The engineer who is supposed to prepare the uh, structural designs, the civil engineer in this case, is regulated by Engineers Board of Kenya, as well as other engineers in that space. Uh, the contractors who are supposed to do the construction are regulated by National Construction Authority. The skilled construction workers and site supervisors who are supposed to be doing the actual work, these are the people employed by the contractors, are also regulated by National Construction Authority. Beyond there, you also need to have environmental issues taken care of, so we have NEMA in place. Now, depending where construction is taking place, if it's near water body, uh, riparian space, you need Water Resource Authority. If it's near airports or a flight path, you need Kenya Civil Aviation Authority. You need... Um, um, uh, many other players in this space. Now, if a building has been constructed and for some reason safety audit has to be done, there is National Building Inspectorate, mm. who we work also very uh, closely with. So, and many more. So, there are about 12 of, uh, or so that we have mapped out. And these are, and we work with them. And remember, in all this space, county has the primary responsibility to actually give development control permission for construction to take place. So one of the regulators is also the county. So to answer your question is that how do we work with this? We work with them collaboratively because even for us to register a project, which is part of our mandate, we must register a project that meets the requirements, regulatory uh, legal uh, requirements that happens in all the space. And if you don't work with all these people, then how do we even confirm that these things have gone through uh, 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 what we call uh, due diligence in terms of approval, uh, where, where they're supposed to be approved. So, to answer your question, is that yes, we work very collaboratively with all these uh, players so that we at least we achieve our mandate, which is oversight and coordination. So, coordination here is key. You cannot coordinate an item, there must be many items for that coordination to happen. <laughs> and yet, 
we have situations where buildings collapse, which means these bodies that form this collaboration exist, yes, but then one has to question how effective their roles are. Yet, we have situations where uh, construction sites come up with estates and what have you, and the complementing institutions that are supposed to be there, like, say, a playground or a school or something, you suddenly find is, is, is simply not there. I mean, I'm asking this question because your office is likely to be overburdened by people who come querying. We have the institutions. That's really the point. Do they have the ability to execute their mandate? Meaning, a complaint comes to your office. We have a listener who sent me a message about some issues they've had mm. in Lovington. And those matters have been brought to your office. Now, it can't be the only issue that has been brought to the office. There, may be, there must be many others. Now, my question is, question number two. You have the office, we have the regulations, we have the rule book. Do you have the capacity to ensure that you can actually conduct the duties that your office has been assigned and that your office is mandated to do? Very good. So we know we have uh, many institutions, as you have put it, mm. and we have our distinct roles and uh, we have our strengths and capabilities to deliver our mandate. But just as you put it, if we all keep working separately, then all these issues are bound to occur. So what have we done as a national construction authority? What we have done, we have reached out to all the players in this sector, and we have um, come up with what we call a multi-agency approach. And I'm happy that uh, this approach is being embraced um, uh, by many institutions so that we work as a team, so that we end up with what we all, almost call a one-stop shop, shop, if you may call it. Mm. And this is now really helping to, uh, to, to bring all our uh, unique strengths together to work uh, towards a common objective. So that if my role is to uh, regulate contractors, uh, register projects, accredited uh, construction workers and site supervisors, as well as, well as uh, carry out quality assurance inspections. Mm. And I know there are also other players in the same space. We work jointly and collaboratively so that we do it as a team. You know, there is an aspect which is, can be called fatigue. You know when mm. today NC is on your site, mm. tomorrow is the county, the other day is NEMA, the other day is, you know, it becomes you as a developer, you start you're asking. Like, uh, you know, these people should. Don't yeah. have other places it's like you're sending each other. Yeah, so, so what we have done now in mm. this space is to actually work together, also share information as much as possible, and have periodic engagements to ensure that uh, we now work as a team. So, in fact, now developers have no space to, to run to or to hide. Mm. Mm. Because if you think you're going to hide from this particular uh, uh, space or institution, you realize already you have the information, mm. and you just deal with it on spot on. Okay. On a matter of complaints, mm -hmm. which is what the... Um, the gist of uh, uh, his question was. Mm. Uh, of course, on a day-to-day, -day, we receive a lot of complaints and uh, we deal with them. And when those complaints come, we also reach out to uh, the primary uh, 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 actors mm. or entities to ensure that we address those complaints and we close them uh, as soon as possible. Okay. Yeah. So then who has the responsibility for censure? Because now you are essentially, you know, um, regulating all of these folks in this industry if something goes wrong who then has the responsibility for censure for uh, prosecution investigation all of this very good remember we are working as a team as a gov one, one, one government approach yes. it's, it's called the um, uh, whole government approach mm -hmm. uh, what it means is that there is each player in fact you've raised uh, a question that is um, very important mm -hmm. even for the Monainchi out there Remember, if an incident occurs, for instance, sometimes you have a building collapsing, mm. you know that's already a disaster. Yes. And I also want to confirm that this particular code also addresses the issue of disaster management, mm. which is not in the old code, mm. the code that we are trying to repeal. Now, when an incident occurs, it could be a, a, a bridge collapsing, it could be a building collapsing, it could be a trench collapsing, and so on and so forth. It can collapse at every other stage. Mm -hmm. And once this occurs, now we carry out investigations, and upon conclusion of those investigations, if the recommendation is to the extent that there was some culpability 
of any player, maybe the contractor, the developer, or any other player in that space, then this matter is reported to uh, reach out to the, 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 the police department, the, mm -hmm. the CI, mm -hmm. or the director of public prosecutions for action to be taken. In fact, in some instances, for instance, when the building is still going on and we are carrying out our inspections and we find out there's non-compliance, maybe the project is not registered or there's no registered contractor or there's no issues of health and safety or is of course, we look at the, 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 the magnitude of the non-compliance eh? mm. and the not notori how notorious it is. Then we actually suspend that and we take, um, uh, we press charges against that particular offender okay. in, in court uh, through, of course, the prosecution team. So we very work very collaboratively. So in terms of who is responsible, uh, it's both at individual institutional level and also collaboratively mm. so that we all um, um, work as a team and address this issue. Okay. Yeah. What if you find that the particular individual or, or organization then is not, uh, cannot continue with said project? Cities in the middle of construction. The who? Choose some. The architect has, there's a flaw. No, forget about the architect. The, the, con, the contractor on the ground, mm. there's something that they're not doing right. You come in as the authority. This individual is suspended, right? But this work must go on. What happens? Very good. In fact, um, many a times when we have carried out investigations and the Board of National Constitution Authority has conducted a, a full inquiry mm -hmm. and come up with recommendations, in many instances, some contractors have been suspended. Mm -hmm. Now, actually that question goes beyond even the project that is under construction. Mm -hmm. You know, a contractor may have more than one project, yes. more than one site, mm -hmm. by different uh, clients. Yes. Mm -hmm. So on this site is client A, and client A is the one where the contractor had an issue and the board has suspended this particular contractor. Mm -hmm. What do we do? We do an extent analysis. Which other sites mm -hmm. or which other projects this particular contractor is carrying out, mm -hmm. is doing? So then we reach out to all the developers and to the developers where this contractor is working and inform them that this is to bring to your attention that this contractor has been suspended. And for this case, this project cannot continue with the same contractor. You need to find out... Um, an alternative contractor will continue working if you are to continue their project. Yeah. So to that extent, that would, so it's very punitive mm. for a contractor that has been suspended because you lose business basically. Sure. So you not want to go to that extent. So it is um, it is important uh, for the comfort of us as Kenyans to ensure that for a contractor who has been uh, suspended, you can not continue to do work anywhere else until the suspension period is over. Mm. You could even be deregistered. Suspension is just one of the actions that can be taken. It's a yellow card. But you can also remove you from the register. Mm. A red card. <laughs> now you cannot practice anywhere. <laughs> For the Mulenji, yeah. somehow, everything you say makes sense, but for it to be in consumable quantities. For instance, if I have an issue that I want to raise with your authority, I'm going to give the example of KRA, who will tell you if you have a dispute, you do this. If it doesn't work, you go here and expect a response within this number of days. If Does the authority have such a system where if somebody has a problem, they are told within five, six, ten days, whatever it is, we, we will respond mm -hmm. to you. And if that doesn't work, do this. Do, do you have communication? Do you have a platform with the citizenry so that there can be a back and forth? You can receive information and you can give back information. Very good. Three things. Number one, we have a service charter. Mm. A service charter is what defines our commitment mm. to Monainchi, our commitment to the citizen, that uh, if a complaint is raised, we respond within this number of days. I think for complaint, we have a three-day uh, respon response window. And within the three days, even if just to see we have no acknowledged uh, the receipt, uh, we've received this information and we're working on it, if you don't have the immediate uh, answer, we need to carry out some uh, additional investigation. That commitment is there to the Mwanainchi. Uh, to the extent that um, somebody, action has been taken against someone because you've raised an important point. You know, we may take action, adverse action against um, uh, one of our licensees, like a contractor, for instance, has been suspended and they feel maybe it is not fair. Then they have a recourse. Mm. They can go to the national construction appeals board mm -hmm. yeah there's ncab 
National Constitution Appeals Board. The A in the NCA is not the authority. National the Constitution Appeals, Appeals Board. Board. <laughs> so this board also looks at those who are not, um, um, what's the word, satisfied mm -hmm. with the decision made by the Board of National Constitution Authority. You can go there and appeal. It's like a quasi court. So after going to the Appeals Board, the, the decision they make is binding uh, to, to us and to the person who petitioned NCA at that point. So it's important to understand that, yes, we have a commitment to the Wananchi, and even if they're not happy, they can also go to another place. And there's also the ombudsman, the, um, the place where if you feel NCA has not addressed your complaint or they have taken too long, mm. they can also take us to, um, what do you normally call them? The, the Commission of, the commission the administrative, of uh, justice. administrative Justice. Mm. Yes. And that is where now we also checked as an institution. So a government as a whole has got so many checks and balances right. that I think we are bound to uh, uh, abide by. Yeah. So back to the building code as we conclude. Where is it now? Is it in Parliament? Is it going through public participation? How soon do we anticipate to have a new building code? Yes, yeah, so the building code as we speak now has uh, 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 been fully drafted by the Attorney General's office and we are grateful for the support. Uh, we, have also, we have now, before we it's published by the minister, because the minister in charge of public works, that's the minister for land, oh, lands, minister for lands, housing, housing urban, urban development, and public and works, public works. Um, uh, is uh, expected to gazette this. Mm. But uh, before it's gazetted, because the next stage is gazettement by the minister, mm. but before it's gazetted, we are doing what we call um, 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 uh, pre-publication scrutiny, which is uh, uh, um, an opportunity to engage both houses of parliament, basically the committee of delegated legislation of the Senate, mm -hmm. the committee of delegated legislation of the National Assembly, so that if we have taken them through, they may have some comments that we also need to consider uh, before it is published, so that when it goes to the floor of the two houses after publication by the minister, uh, they'll uh, consider it, and once adopted, it becomes uh, a legal document. So the stage we are in at the moment mm. is that uh, engagement of the two houses. And I want to confirm that the Senate uh, uh, already, uh, we've engaged them. They gave us uh, very good comments mm -hmm. that are also very enriching. We are now waiting to engage the National Assembly, the same committee of uh, delegated legislation. Once we've engaged them, now, if there are any comments, they'll be incorporated. And then the minister will publish this document after publication. Of course, within seven days mm -hmm. after publication, um, he'll notify the Speaker of National Assembly and also notify the Speaker of the Senate uh, both houses and those speakers uh, once they receive the two i mean the, the two notifications mm. they are expected to commit this document to the relevant committee uh, 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 so that they look at it and if they're happy they bring it to the, the, the floor of parliament uh two parliament two houses if once approved it takes a legal effect so we are giving um ourselves of course we may not have control of the of the timelines the, the, in the, parliament in parliament but, but our prayer mm is that within the first quarter, and you know, government in terms of quarters, we have first quarter is 1st July to 30th uh, September. Mm. Within that quarter, the space we are currently in, in mm. terms of quarters, uh, this document should see the light of day. Okay. And the government uh, and, and the, our country will have a document that will ensure that we have, we have, we have a safe built environment. Mm. We have a built environment that is of good quality and uh, is of order and sanity. Very good. Thank Looking you. forward to that. Yeah. Engineer Maurice Akech, Executive Director and Registrar of Contractors at the National Construction Authority. Let's look forward to engaging more on the new building code. This is the Situation Room, the only way to start your day.